everybody to uh, today's uh, CSRC colloquium. The speaker will be Professor Daniel uh, Weizen. Uh, so uh, Professor Weizen got his PhD in 2003 from the, at the University of uh, Berkeley. Uh, he did work on the so-called D0 experiment at Fermilab. Uh, he was a postdoc from 2004 to 2007 at the University of Pennsylvania. Uh, and then moved on uh, back, I mean, came back to the West Coast, got a position at UC Irvine in 2007, and where he's now a full professor. Uh, professor Weizen uh, is a fellow of the American Physical Society since 2016. Uh, in 2013 and 2016, he got two UCI Chancellor Awards for Excellence in Fostering Undergrad Research. Also, I want to mention that in 2015, he got what's called the Webby Award, which is an international award honoring excellence on the internet. Uh, and uh, also in 2007, he was the DOE Outstanding Junior Investigator. There are a few more honors and uh, uh, things I could mention, but this should do it for now. Uh, the last thing is that in 2007, in 2017, uh, he, he's a co-PI on an MSF machine learning grant over uh, 3 million US dollars from, it runs from 2017 to 2022. And I guess he's gonna to, uh, tell us about machine learning today. So without further ado, I, want, like, I wanted to uh, welcome Professor Weizen and I'm looking forward to his presentation entitled Learning Particle Physics from Machines. So it's all yours, Daniel. Thank you very much. That was a very kind invitation. Sure. Um, a very kind introduction. Um, and thank you, everybody who's attending this uh, unusual virtual colloquium. So thanks for your interest and thanks for willing to connect. Um, it's a shame that I can't come down to San Diego and hang out with all of you in person and share a beer. But I hope that you're all somewhere safe and having a, a beer in the safety of your own homes. So indeed, today I want to talk to you about not just using machine learning to solve problems in physics, which is something we've been doing for a while, but how we can learn from the machines themselves, how we can set these machines to solve problems and then take that information back from them. Because in the end, physics is a human problem and it's for humans and by humans. And we need to make sure that what we learn is something that humans can understand. So, First, let's remember that we have a lot of physics to learn. If you summarize how much we understand about the universe in terms of like what fraction of it, the mass and energy fraction of the universe that we understand, well, only about 5% of the universe is something we really understand at all. That's the stuff that makes up me and you and hamsters and beers and, and viruses and all sorts of crazy stuff. And the rest of it is something we're just beginning to wrap our minds around dark matter and there's dark energy. And here you see a simple pie chart that shows you just what fraction of the universe is something we have been able to grapple with. And you might think, well, that's sort of disappointing. We've been doing science for hundreds of years. Why don't we know more about the universe? But I think it's exhilarating. I think it's inspirational because it means that we have, you know, big discoveries ahead of us. The true nature of the universe has yet to be revealed. The way things actually work on a microscopic scale, uh, the way things are organized in the large scale structure, all of these things are discoveries that are in our future, which means that me or you or some young kid or your grandchild might be the person to have a crazy mind blowing revelation about the nature of the universe. But these days you hear a lot about deep learning and how people are using deep learning to accelerate their science and their learning about the universe. There's a lot of misinformation and misunderstanding about what deep learning is, especially the deep part of it. And so today I want to talk to you about what deep learning is and why we need to use it, and specifically how we apply it to particle physics. And very briefly, in one slide, the reason that we use deep learning or machine learning in particle physics is because our data does not look like this. If our goal was to find weird new animals, then the hard thing would be to find them. Once you have them, it's pretty obvious what it is. Like, yes, this is a unicorn. The tricky bit is finding the unicorn. But in our case, our data don't look like this. It's not like we find some new particle and once you make it, you're very sure what it is. You have a clear understanding of what you made. 
Instead, our data look more like this. We have indirect evidence of collisions, the very high energy, and the only way we observe them is by looking at the stuff that flies out from the decay. You can't see the collision itself. You can't see what comes out of the collision immediately. Only what interacts with these layers of detectors that surround the collision point. So no event can be unambiguously interpreted. You can't look at this event and say, this was a Higgs boson. This was a Z. This was some new dark matter particle. Everything is statistical in particle physics. Everything could be one thing or could be something else. So we're always asking statistical questions of our data. And the very way we make discoveries is by doing statistics. And that's because <clears throat> this process we're trying to probe, maybe you com combine two gluons and make a Higgs boson, the process itself is invisible to us. And there's more than one way that you could pr produce, for example, two bottom quarks. Here you see an example of a Higgs boson being made in the darkness, decaying into two bottom quarks. But there are many other ways to make the same signature. So every time you look at your detector, you say, oh, I see two bottom quarks. That doesn't mean it was a Higgs boson. It means maybe it was a Higgs boson. Maybe it was something else. So first, I want to talk about why we need machine learning, talk a little bit more about how we ask these statistical tests. It's vital that we understand, that we have a common understanding of, of the question we're asking, so we understand the tool we're using to ask it and why that tool has to be deep machine learning. And then we'll talk about what we've learned from those machines, what, what, we can, what physics we can suck out of the, the machine. Okay, so I've told you that when we ask a question about discovering new particles, we do it in a statistical manner. That doesn't mean it has to be written in equations. We can talk about what that means in terms of, of little cartoons. So usually our statistical question is something like a hypothesis test. We're asking, do the data prefer one description of nature, meaning the standard model with the existing particles and all that stuff, or do they prefer a description that includes some new particle? So we're really just asking, is this theory correct? We're asking which theory is a better descriptor of nature, right? And if you had a really simple setup, imagine some scenario where you devised an experiment to measure something, and the number of events you saw in your experiment told you um, something about which hypothesis was more likely. And this is an inference problem. You say, well, if H0 um, is the truth, then I should expect this distribution of outcomes from my experiment. But if H1 is the truth, I should expect a different distribution of outcomes. So then by looking at the number of events, you should be able to infer the relative likelihood of H0 or H1. So this is pretty straightforward. If you have one dimensional experiment, you're measuring one number. And in this case, it's really nice because you can just make a threshold. You can say, if I observe a number of events greater than my threshold, then I'll declare H1 to be true. Otherwise, I'll declare H0. And the nice thing about the threshold here is that it balances false discovery, where you claim H1 to be true, but it wasn't, and misdiscovery, where H1 was true, but you claimed H0. By tuning this threshold, you can get the exact ratio you like. You want to be really conservative and only cl um, claim H1 when the evidence is overwhelming, or do you want to be a little um, faster and looser and make claims at a lower confidence level. You can tune it with this threshold. Now that's great if your data is in one dimension, but we all know that data these days are very complicated, they're very high dimension. And already if you make the jump from one dimension to two dimensions, this problem of how you make your decision surface, where you draw the line between H1 and H0, is infinitely complicated. You can imagine using straight lines like you see here on the left or one straight line, or some curved line. And there's an infinite number of ways you can make this distinction, because H1 and H0 are not perfectly separated. So in every case, you'll be balancing false versus missed discovery. So how do we draw the line between H0 and H1 in two dimensions? If we can't do it in two, how can we possibly do it in a hundred or a thousand or a million dimensions like our data uh, reflect? Well, it turns out this really hard problem was solved many years ago by Neyman and Pearson. They say that all you need to do 
to find the place to put your decision service, the way to distinguish H0 and H1 is to look at the ratio of these two probability densities. So here they're expressed as likelihoods because the data are fixed and we're varying hypotheses. And so they are likelihoods. So this ratio, these two is a likelihood ratio. And we say where this likelihood ratio is greater than some arbitrary value, then we'll say H1 and below it we'll say H0. And the reason this works is, is very intuitive, is the regions in your data space in X where H1 is more likely are the places you're gonna to want to declare H1. And the places where it's less likely, you're gonna to want to declare H0. And the really cool thing about this is that it doesn't depend on the dimensionality of X. This works if X is one dimensional, it's just a line. This works if X is two dimensional. In two dimensions, it can trace out, look at this X1 versus Y1. It doesn't have to be a circle, it doesn't have to be an ellipse, it doesn't have to be something simple. It uses the contour of the hypotheses to find these, these contours of equal likelihood ratio. And those trace out your decision surfaces. And you can still tune the knob. You can still say, oh, I want really conservative or I want really non-conservative decision making. But the, it tells you exactly where these contours are. So you can just pick the contour you want. And it works in four dimensions. It works in 4,000 dimensions. It works in an arbitrary number of dimensions. It's an astoundingly important and consequential result because it lets you take an infinite dimensional, arbitrarily high dimensional problem and turn it into a one dimensional problem. The output of this is a scalar. And you just tune your threshold and say, I want to make a decision in that way. Okay, so then isn't particle physics pretty easy? I mean, if you can calculate this quantity, the probability of seeing your data X given some hypothesis, then you can do this statistical question. You can discover the Higgs boson. And you might suspect, well, surely particle physicists can do this. I mean, we build our own detectors. It's not like we're just gathering this data from the field. We construct the detectors. We should understand them. So we should be able to calculate the probability of seeing data in our detector under various hypotheses, like if there's dark matter or if there's Higgs bosons or whatever. We built these detectors to discover those particles. Well, it's hard though. We have an understanding of how detectors work, but it's a multi-stage process with non-perturbative non theories that are difficult to write down. So what happens is you have a very hard collision in the center between the constituents of a proton, and then those things fly out, and there's, there's strong nuclear interactions, which are non-perturbative and very difficult to model. And then those particles hydrogenize, and then those particles interact with the layers of the detector, which is stochastic, right? Those interactions are truly random and quantum mechanical. So we do not have a way of writing down this theory, the probability of the data given the theory. We can model the microphysical process. We can say when a quark flies out, maybe this is what happens, and maybe this is what happens, and maybe this is what happens, but we can't write down a theory that we can use to calculate that says, here's the probability of seeing this bit of your detector turning on if there's a Higgs boson. Or what's the probability of seeing that bit of the detector turning on if there's dark matter? We just don't know how to calculate that. And that's endlessly frustrating, I'll be honest, because if we had that, our whole field would be a much simpler. But we don't. Instead, we're not, we're not uh, you know, um, the ship is not sinking, we can do this, but instead of calculating this directly, instead what we have is a simulator. We can take a starting point, and we can run our simulation, and we get an outcome. And we do that over and over again. Much like this famous graph of where this hurricane is going to go. Is it going to hit Alabama? Is it going to hit Florida? Depending on the details of the initial condition and the random numbers you throw along the way, you get a different distribution of outcomes. This is just like what we do in particle physics. We take a collision, and then we take the outcomes of, of those collisions, and we propagate them through our detector to understand what we think is happening, what might happen. We get a distribution of the possible outcomes for any individual collision. So we don't know this function, this function that describes the probability of various outcomes, but we can simulate it. But simulating it doesn't mean that we have the function. It means we have a bunch of examples drawn from the function, just like this description of the hurricane. 
Well, how do we go from having a bunch of examples to calculating the function? Because we need the function to calculate the likelihood ratio. Well, if you have a bunch of examples and you don't know what the function is, you can estimate what the function is. And this is not a complicated thing to do, though it sounds fancy. For example, look at these red lines. Each one models an example point drawn from this function, which happens to be a Gaussian. If you want to recreate the function itself, you can just take each point and say, well, there are going to be more points in places where the function is highest. So I'll just put a little blob of, of, um, of um, probability density everywhere I have an example, and that will let me build up an estimate of my function. And if I don't have a lot of examples, my estimate will be poor. If I have a lot of examples, my estimate will be excellent. And it will converge to the true function if I have an infinite number of unbiased samples. But how many do you need? Well, you know, for particle physics, so pick a number. Say you need about 100 in order to determine the shape of this probability density well enough to calculate a likelihood ratio. That's fine in one dimension, right? If you need to have 100 example events, you can determine the shape of the probability density. What about in two dimensions? Do you need 200 examples? You don't. You need 100 times 100 because you've got to capture all the correlations. Remember, we have to calculate this thing in two dimensions and get all the contours. That means instead of 100 uh, boxes to, uh, to understand, you have 100 times 100 boxes to understand. And then in n dimensions, it's not n 100, it's 100 to the n. So a 10-dimensional problem might require 100 to the 10 um, simulated events. And our simulator is, is not very fast. It takes minutes and minutes and minutes for a single collision to be made. And that's because the data are very complicated and the experiment is complicated. In fact, the data that we read out from our detectors is much more than 100-dimensional. It's more like 100 million-dimensional. We read out 100 million channels for every single collision. So imagine now trying to describe <clears throat> the distribution of likelihood of likely um, hits in that detector in 100 million dimensional space and get all the correlations right. It's essentially impossible. It's impossible, but it's a computational problem. It's not a theoretical problem. It's not a conceptual problem. We know how to do it. If we had infinite computing power somehow, like on the show devs, then we could just do it, right? We could predict it no problem. And we wouldn't have any need for any fancier statistics or machine learning. But instead, we don't. We have this very high dimensional space, and we do not know how to describe our theories in that space. So that space is, is not anything fancy or complicated or, or theoretical. It's just the space of possible outcomes in our detector. Remember, we spent 15 minutes talking about the statistics, but really it can be summarized very simply. We would just like to know if you have a Higgs boson, what are the likely outcomes in your detector? If you have a dark matter, what signature should you expect in your detector? It's a very simple and basic thing to want to know about various hypotheses you're testing. How would we, they look? What would, how could we see them? So we can't do that because the data space are too high dimensional. All right, so here's how machine learning helps us. This is why we need to understand the statistical question so we understand the role machine learning is playing. And you'll see why for many years it was failing to play that role very well. So here's the task for machine learning. It says find a function, some function, I, won't, I have no restriction on the function, except <clears throat> I want that function to start from my high dimensional data space and go down to one dimension because that's all I can really handle with my sample generation. And I want this function to contain the same hypothesis testing power as my likelihood ratio. I want to use it in place of my likelihood ratio because I don't know how to calculate it. So maybe machine learning, hey, you can figure out the likelihood ratio for me. Great, awesome, thank you. But if you can't, find something else which is one-to-one -one with the likelihood ratio or serves the same purpose as the likelihood ratio. And so that's our goal is ask machine learning find this function. Right? And I think that, you know, in the age of um, coming AI overlords, it's very important that we learn how to talk to AI and that we be, we be very clear about what we want. So this is what I want from machine learning. Find me this function.
but it's a hard problem to solve, right? There's an infinite space of possible things you could search for. So as you, in you as a, a so a typical strategy when you're searching an infinite space of possibilities is to break that space up and discretize it somehow, organize it, systemize it, and then search the systemized version of it. So what we do is say that problem is too hard, it's too broad. Let's limit it. Let's say instead of searching every possible function, let's say that we can only consider functions that are built out of little mini functions. So we have these mini functions y of x, which operate on your data. We'll talk about them in a minute. And you're allowed to take those and do as many of those as you want. Take the output from y, repass it through y again, combine them in any way you want. They're like tinker toys. Imagine you're building these things up out of these mini basis functions. So that restricts our space. Instead of any possible function, we say, let's just build little functions out of y of x. Now you might think, how do you know that your space built out of y of x still contains the answer you're looking for? Well, we don't. It's an assumption without justification. It's a hope. We have found practically that this works pretty well. Um, but it's not uh, an assumption that we can justify. It's not a general statement. And the function that we choose is this one. We have h, which is some nonlinear activation function, which just takes a weighted sum over your data. A little offset, a weighted sum of the data vector, pass that through some nonlinear activation function. And your activation function might look like this. This is what a neuron looks like in the brain. Take some input. If that input passes the threshold, boom, it turns on and fires. Otherwise, it doesn't. And the idea is that if you use these neurons, these nonlinear activation functions, to transform your data, and then you stitch some of these things together, right? So here's a graphical description. X are your data. Each of these nodes on the left are an input vector, like measurement from your detector or whatever. And then you connect them to your output here with these lines. This is just a visual representation of the function you're looking at, where, for example, the weight uh, for each data vector could be indicated by the strength <clears throat> or the thickness of the line. And this lets you describe you know, your function. So you transform the problem now. You say, instead of looking through an infinite space of possible functions, I've defined the space in terms of a weight space. I say, now just find the weights for these functions. Find a way to put them together, and then find the weights for each of these little functions. So find the point in that weight space which best solves your problem. All right, so now it's a little bit better defined. We have a space to search, the space of weights of these little y functions, and we have a way to determine how well things are working. Now give me a set of, of y functions and their weights and their weight values, and I've essentially I have a function which I can evaluate on my, on my vector, and then I can evaluate it. I can say, does that do a good job? Does it uh, give me a good performance? Can it tell the difference between Higgs boson and no Higgs boson? And so that's my quality metric, you know, classification or um, uh, significance of discovery or something like that. And now my goal is find the point in this weight space which maximizes that metric. Say, give me the function that performs best in this task. All right, so now we have to search the space, which is, again, a very difficult problem and one that is not solved in general, right? If you have an arbitrary function in an arbitrary space and say, find me the point in this space which maximizes this function, nobody knows how to do that in a general, provable way. It will always find you the maximum. It's not a solved problem. If you know how to do that, you can solve a lot of open problems in science, but nobody knows how to do it. So instead, what we do is we do some heuristic. We start at a point and we just look at how well things work and we think about how well things will work if we move in that space. And we do a simple greedy algorithm, assuming that the space is simply shaped and we can just essentially walk uphill towards the maximum. And that's why machine learning is a bit of an art because you don't always get to the maximum. Sometimes you get to a little bit of a hill and there's a mountain nearby and you don't even know it's there. And so this is a very difficult thing, constructing the right function, searching the space. This is why there are people who are really good at machine learning and people who do not know how to make machine learning work. It's because there's no general prescription for finding the function in the space. This is the learning step. Constructing your network in a way that makes it easy to find and then finding the network. You'll find people have all sorts of tricks that they cannot justify. And that's because this is in general not a solved problem. 
but we've been doing it a long time in particle physics. We've applied machine learning to lots of problems. We've been using networks. Particle physics has been using machine learning since the 90s or earlier to do tracking, to do reconstruction, to make decisions about what data to keep or not to keep. All right, so now we know why we need machine learning. It's because we do not have infinite computing power. And so we need machine learning to reduce the dimensionality of our data space to one dimension so that we can do statistics on it. So we can't simulate our data in more than one dimension. Why do we need deep learning? I mean, we've been doing machine learning for decades. What's the problem? Why deep learning? The problem is that our machine learning and particle physics until five years ago was kind of dumb. And you can imagine our networks here, it looks something like this. We have a vector of inputs, this is your data. We have one output. And in order to get complex behavior, in order to have like uh, a function f of x on your data, which can navigate around interesting features in your data, you don't just have one layer. You don't just connect the input directly to the output. You have a hidden layer. This lets you involve your input through, your, through the um, activation function and then do it again. You have like different weights connecting the input layer and the hidden layer. It gives you more flexibility. The problem with having hidden layers is that it makes the problem harder to solve. Like now, you see that it doesn't get the output right. You want to know, well, how do I adjust all the weights so it gets the output more correct the next time? It's this problem of searching the weight space. You've made the weight space bigger, and you've made the gradients smaller. Because now the input is less directly connected to the output. So those gradients, these lines, uh, the gradients on the, met, on, the, on the things you're looking for, which is the parameters, and get smaller and smaller. Well, we found out in particle physics that if, as long as you had about one layer, it wasn't a big deal. We could mostly do this training. It worked pretty well. The gradients were big enough that we could find the solution. And then somebody wrote a paper in the 90s saying that as long as you had one hidden layer, you could model any function. Any function on the inputs could be modeled um, um, with just one single hidden layer in the network. Wow. This is a great paper because it told us that we were doing a good job of searching the space. I mean, your fear is that you get all this valuable data about the universe, you put it into your network, and it doesn't figure out how to combine it to get you the most information out. That's like information is being wasted, or lost on the floor. Like what a tragedy that would be. So it was great relief to hear that we had some confidence that one layer was enough. The problem is, this paper wasn't wrong, it was correct, but the paper had a clause in there qualified to its conclusions. And the paper said, this is true, however, it may be that the hidden layer must be very large. So for some functions, your hidden layer would have to be effectively infinite in order to describe that function. And if that's the function you need to get the power out of your data, you're not going to find it if you have one hidden layer. <clears throat> and in particle physics, we have a lot of functions which are very nonlinear. And I showed you the activation function. It's nonlinear, but to get a very complex behavior, you need to convolve that nonlinear function several times. And what that means is that these networks with one hidden layer, they're just not very good at finding highly nonlinear functions on your input. And for example, if you have a bunch of momenta and you want to calculate the mass of a particle, that's a very nonlinear function. It's also a very powerful function. It's one we use very often in particle physics to tell, is this a Higgs boson or something else? So this means that single layer, uh, single hidden layer networks are not smart enough to get the information out of our data. You can't just take your data and say, here are all my particle data, figure it out for me, I'm going to lunch. And when I come back, I want you to have written my discovery paper so I can win the Nobel Prize. And this is something we knew in particle physics. We had to do all these really careful studies every time we use machine learning. Say, should I give it this piece of data? Should I give it this piece of data? And here you see this table. It's a list of input variables that were considered uh, for using in some application of, of machine learning and particle physics. And the dot means we used it, and the no dot means we didn't use it. And in order to figure out what to use, they had to try every possible configuration of variables because you give it too much and it gets overwhelmed. You don't give it the right combination, it doesn't figure out the problem. You even have to do things like take ratios of variables. Here you see, for example, ratios of PTs. Like the network already has that information. It should be able to figure out how to calculate a ratio, but it couldn't. 
So this was the sort of state of the art about five years ago. People knew the machine learning had great power, but that we weren't tapping into it, that there was information being lost. And to use machine learning effectively, you have to do a lot of the work in advance. So you have to pre-process the data in your mind, come up with simple variables that you could feed to your network, and then you could maybe solve your problem. And then came along deep networks. About five years ago, I was describing to our colleagues in the computer science department uh, my frustration with the inability of machine learning to solve our problems with our need to be clever. Because anytime you need humans to be clever, you have to ask, are we being clever enough? Are there ideas we missed? I would love a more automatic guarantee that we're using all the information we need data. And Pierre Baldi said, well, now we can train deep networks. We have computers and training tricks that allow us to have multiple hidden layers. And that's all deep learning means. It just means learning with a more sophisticated algorithm, with more parameters, with more layers. And not just uh, more layers in, your, in a single, more, <clears throat> not just more nodes in a single hidden layer, but more layers. This is crucial because it allows you to involve the same function multiple times and explore more nonlinear space functions. And there are a lot of very important deep uh, real world applications. For example, Facebook uses deep learning to answer the question, is this a picture of Sylvester Stallone? And it's a very complicated team and they're very well funded. In fact, the funding for this group deep face of Facebook is probably larger than the National Science Foundation. It's incredible uh, the power of consumer device, their desires. All right, so here and I wrote a paper together with his postdoc Peter Sadowski, who's now in Hawaii, and we studied, could deep networks do a better job at extracting information from our data than we are doing currently? And we came up with a simple hypothesis, a, a simple benchmark problem, to try to show the problem we were having. An example where, where normal networks were failing and we were hoping deep networks could step in. So in this case, we consider some signal that we're looking for. It's a heavy Higgs boson that decays to another Higgs, that decays to another Higgs. And the final state is two Ws and then two bottom ports. Now you can also produce this same thing in your detector another way. You could just make two top quarks and you still get two Ws and two bottoms. So this is the statistical problem. If you have this in your detector, WWBB, do you know if it was signal or background? And that's exactly the question we want to probe. But specifically, we wanted to know, can deep networks figure out what, what variables to use automatically, or do we still need human smarts? So here's a sort of raw level information. We just take the stuff that's fl flying out of the, of the um, collision, and say, so we'll just measure their energy. So these are transverse momenta. We also have directions. And in, in total, we have about 21 variables. We've already boiled it down from a very high dimensional problem, 21 variables. And these are distributions of the signal and background in one dimensional projections of this 20 dimensional space. Of course, it's not, it's losing a lot of information, um, but in one dimension, you can see that these, this problem is not very easy to solve. Then we compared that, we said, well, what would a physicist do? The state of the art currently is to use a physicist, apply their brain, and boil the data down further to be relevant information, because we don't think the network can find it by itself. So here we said, well, there are features in these Feynman diagrams, these lines that indicate certain masses. And so if you calculate the, hyp the hypothetical mass of these particles, you should see peaks where those masses are. And you should see even broader, <coughs> broader distributions where, their part where the particles weren't. And so these mass calculations are very powerful in discriminating between the signal and the background cases. You can see in these one-dimensional projections already, there's a lot more power to separate. All right, so what we did is we said, we gave that data to a, to a physicist and said, use your standard tools. Whatever physicists are doing now, use your best machine learning strategy, which would be a shallow network, and see what, what uh, you can get out of this. And so this plot you're looking at here is a typical kind of plot you look at. We talk about the performance of a network to separate signal from background. Signal efficiency as on the x-axis, and background rejection on the y. And what you want is to be in the top right corner, where you're keeping all of your signal, and you're rejecting all of your background. But of course, nothing achieves that. 
Instead, as you scan a, um, a threshold over your classifier output, you see a cartoon in the top left there, you get a very, you, get a, you draw a line, signal efficiency versus background projection. What you want is to be as close to that as possible. And computer scientists measure your performance by integrating under this curve and, say, and getting the area. So they call this AUC, area under the curve. Right? And you know, when you collaborate with people from other fields, you discover they have different names for the, the same thing you're familiar with already. So we call it an integral, they call it the area under the curve. Anyway, what you see here is tests for a shallow network with different kinds of input. So in the black line, you get just the low level input without the physics pre-processing. And you see it figures out how to separate the signal and background, but doesn't do a great job. The red line is what happens when you give it the high level information. My physics brain applied to this problem to make it simpler. You see it does better. Now that is, a, is actually bad news. It's bad news because it means that it needed help. It already had the same information in the black line, but it failed to find it. In fact, the black line has more information in theory than the red line and has performs worse. What that means is that it's not very smart. This is exactly the kind of thing we saw all the time in particle physics. You come up with a better variable, even though it's not new information, it helps the machine learning perform better, which means that machine learning hadn't figured that out itself. And that is the thing that terrifies me. It says, well, why are you limited by my creativity? We should be automatically using all the information in the data. So what we conclude from this is that the high level variables that I came up with do not contain all the information, right? And that the low level is failing to figure it out. Okay, so then we pass the same data, the same low and high level data to a deep network. And from Pierre's student, said, see how well you do. So remember the top performer here was about 0.78 or 0.81, depending on how much information you passed in. Here, the deep network on the low level variables performs much better, it's 0.88. And it performs better than a deep network on the high level variables. Right, the high level variables contain less information. So this is exactly what you would expect from a network that is maximizing the information, from a smart network, from a network that's really figuring it out. And in fact, if you add the high level variables, which contain no new information, they're just clues, if you add those to the low level variables and feed all of that to the B network, you don't get any performance improvement over just having the low level variables, which means it had already figured it out. This is no clue for it. It's like, yeah, thank you, I know, right? It doesn't help it at all, right? So here's a direct comparison of the deep network with no physics clues, no human assistance at all, and the shallow network with all the information and my physics clues together. Can you give the difference between the scale of the neural network versus the deep network in your examples? Sure, so the neural network here is a shallow network. It's just one hidden layer. And the deep network in this case, uh, we tried four, five, six, seven, eight layers. The performance maximized around four or five layers. So we can see that the deep network is solving the problem. And the fact that it doesn't improve when you add the physics clues suggests or does not prove that it may have found all the information necessary. Now, does that mean that, <clears throat> that the singularity has arrived, right? That the terminators are on the march? Certainly not. What it means is that in an example benchmark problem where traditional networks are failing to discover discrimination power, deep networks solve the problem. It means that now we have a more powerful computational tool that are able to extract information automatically without human guidance, and they can outperform human guide guided simpler networks. That's wonderful. That means that we can have more confidence that the information is actually coming out of our data. We're not wasting our time and throwing data away. And we applied this same problem to a, we apply these same techniques to a more complicated problem. One about classifying jets. Jets are these sprays of particles that hit our detector. And it's very difficult to tell from a spray of particles which particle made it. Was it a quark? Was it a gluon? Was it a W? They all, all look very similar, but it's very important to us to know which was which. Here, for example, um, are some cases. 
Here on the left, you see a simulated jet of particles depositing energy in the calorimeter. Um, and it's the leftmost example. On the right is a W boson, and that's what it looks like. Now, on the bottom, you see when you take 10,000 of these things and you average them, you see that there are some small deviations between them, but it's a hard problem given this sparse information to learn to tell these two things apart. And however, there is an existing literature. A lot of people in particle physics have come up with very clever physics variables to try to separate these two. And they've calculated these things based on theoretical considerations. And here are some distributions. You can see the blue versus the red tells you uh, whether or not they're able to discriminate them. But it's a hard problem. And so we were wondering, have we figured it out? Is there a missing variable there? Is there something else that's missing? And so we applied uh, these variables and we compare here, the blue line is a, essentially a shallow combination of all these expert variables, the things that theorists came up with. And the red line is what a deep network, a deep network gets when it just gets the low level information. We take all the information from our calorimeter, we set it up like an image, and we treat this like, a, like an image processing problem for a deep network. And the deep network, you see two things. One, it matches the performance of the expert variables. Like we did not give it any clues. We just threw those images at it and say, learn to tell them apart. Not only does it match the performance, it actually exceeds the performance of these experts. And these blue lines and the blue line and the red line here are the ones you should be comparing. They don't look far apart, but this is a log scale. And the difference really is significant. And moreover, our question is, what has it learned? Has it figured out something new? Did it find some completely new way to solve the problem or did you just figure out one little addition? So what we'd like to do is learn from the machine, is to understand what is the nature of its solution? Can we learn some physics from what it figured out? And currently what we're doing in particle physics is we're taking very high dimensional data like this low level image, we pass it through some expert physics knowledge processing and then we get some high level uh, feature, right? It's low dimensional, but it's physics, it's something we can understand. But the problem, of course, is that we don't know whether we're capturing all the information. We think maybe we haven't had all the good ideas yet, or maybe there's something missing in our calculation. And so we worry about missing information. But we prefer to use high level features. We don't want to use a deep network that takes images and makes decisions because we don't understand what it did. Why did you choose this and not that? Uh, are you doing things that's correct? We usually train these networks on simulated data. If that simulated data is wrong in some small way, we could be making the wrong decisions. In addition, we can't really define uncertainties on the inputs for low level data. We can't understand the, uh, an image is like 30 by 30 pixels, that's 900 dimensions. We can't verify the correlations between 900, 900 dimensions. Um, it's very difficult. And also it's not very compact. The low level data is very high dimensional, meaning you have to carry it around every day. So we prefer to use high level variables. Our goal is to find a transformation of the data from low level to high level, which does do as well as a deep network on the low level data, which captures all the information and is understandable in terms of physics. So the question we're asking is, is there a new feature here, a new idea? Can this deep network, if we translate it to the space of human problems, of human ideas, teach us something about physics? Maybe it's just found a way to optimize these variables, or maybe it's found a new idea, or maybe it has a completely new solution that we never even thought of. Wouldn't that be fascinating? So the idea is not to throw away deep learning, but not to use it, not to use the results of deep learning on, on low level data to actually answer statistical questions about our data. Instead, use it as a probe to say how much information is there, then translate that information back into physics and human understanding. All right, well, how do you do that, right? That's hard. How do you talk to a, a neural network and say, what'd you figure out? They don't know English, right? But we don't actually want them to speak English or Spanish or anything. What we want them to do is to speak math or to speak physics. So we want to teach them to speak our language. So we have to define the problem. So our idea was, let's map out the space of all possible solutions. Let's write down 
the general form of any function which could be relevant to this problem. And then let's try to map what the deep network is doing into the space of those functions, because those functions make sense to us. They better. We decide what they were, right? We get to define the space of possible functions so they make sense to us. So define the problem, map the network into that space, then interpret the result. If the network can be compactly mapped into that space, wow, awesome. We've learned something about the nature of the deep network solution. If not, ooh, that's fascinating. That means the solution is outside our space. So maybe the whole problem was we were not thinking broadly enough about the nature of the solution. That's an important clue. So yes or no are both interesting. And in our case, I don't have time to get into it, but we use these energy flow polynomials, which map out all the possible ways you could essentially calculate information from pixel to pixel in the image. But before we did that, we had to understand how do you compare to functions? Like say we have our deep network and we have some function on the input space. How do you know if those two functions are doing the same thing? We don't actually want them to be identical. We don't really care. We just care that they're making the same decisions. Right? We care that if you give it two points, a signal point and a background point, that they agree about which point is more signal-like and which point is more background-like. Let me skip this. All right, so given a point in the input space, we ask, does the deep network order them the same way as the function we're testing, one of these points in this functional space? Okay, and if they have the, if they have the same ordering, then we say, okay, they're making the same decision. That's really all we care about. And then what we do is we integrate over the whole space as much as we can, and we ask, does the deep network make the same decision as the thing we're testing? We're building out a bunch of point, a bunch of these mini functions, putting them together to make a test function, and we're comparing that test function to our deep network. All right, so the first thing we did is we said, well, let's start from the variables we have, right? We have all these high-level features. Let's use the deep network as a sort of input and train it alongside the one, those other ones. So it just captures the residual knowledge. So it just sort of like uh, gets what's left, right? Because that's what we're interested in is, is there a new variable? So we did this and we have this low-level subnet. And then we took the output from that subnet and we used this decision ordering metric to ask, what point in this, in this space we invented is most similar? What point in the space makes the similar decisions to this low-level subnet? And we found one. We found one that works pretty well. It's, it's, it makes very similar decisions to the low-level subnet. And critically, when you add it to the existing set of physics features, it closes the gap. These seven variables together perform just as well as the deep network on the image. So you don't need the whole image. You need more than these six variables, you need this seventh one. And we found this seventh variable by mapping the deep network's decision into this space of functions. That was pretty exciting. So they said, let's get greedy. Let's think, <clears throat> can we map the whole solution of the deep network, throw away what we already know, and start from scratch? Can we, if we had never solved this problem, can we start from zero and build up a new solution? So we did that, and this is more computationally intensive because you have to search the space of possible uh, functions. But what we found is that, um, first of all, the first function, the first point we found captures a huge fraction of the information. The plot on the left is the decision ordering. So as it approaches one, it means you're making exactly the same decision in every case as the deep network. And the plot on the right is the performance, this AUC. <clears throat> and the um, heavy dashed line there is the performance of the deep network on the images. So already we, we found one point in this space which captures, which is making very similar decisions to the deep network and has an excellent performance. And it took about 15 or 20 before we actually matched the performance of the deep network. All right, so what we've learned is that deep learning is a very powerful tool to solve problems of data analysis and particle physics. It can do things that's, that shallow networks cannot do and that we need it to do. However, however, we can't just use it blindly. We don't know what it's doing, it's not useful to us. So we developed a technique to map the results, what it has learned, we went out and solved the, the hard problem, and then we map its solution into a simpler space that we can actually understand. 
thank you very much for your attention. I hope that was interesting to you and um, I'm uh, excited and, and willing to answer any questions you may have. Even maybe exciting talk. Can you hear me? Okay, thank you so much, Daniel, for this exciting talk. Uh, and so now, uh, are there questions? How do you try? Please tell us, it might be good if you state your name. Okay, uh, this is Peter Salomon. Hello. Uh, I'd like to know whether you have a recipe or I mean, I understood the, your um, description, but as far as I understood, you only have, I mean, you, you still have to come up with that missing ingredient just from the physics. I mean, you, does the network help you other than say, yeah, you got it or no? That's not, still not enough. <laughs> That's a great question. Uh, our obligation as physicists is to define the space of the possible answers. And then the network picks out the answer. So there's no way that I know it to automate the space of possible answers. It depends on the problem you're trying to solve. And also depends on how you'd like to hear your answer, right? Think about every silly fable where you ask a question and you get an answer you don't understand. Like, what's the answer to life, the universe, and everything? 42, right? You'd like the answer to come back in a way that makes sense to you. So in this case, you have to define what that means, the language you want to speak. But in the network, absolutely picks out the answer. Using this ADO metric, we scan over the space and compare between the points in that space, which are essentially individual functions, and the network that you train in. So the important components are you use a, a raw deep network to suck out the information, and then you map what it's learned into this space that you define. But yes, you still have to define that space. And so that's an obligation for, for the person who wants the answer. But Hey, being a um, science is a human endeavor and it's for humans. And if we want them to speak our language, AI, we have to define that language. Thank you. So any more questions? So since then at some point this was your summary in part one, you did say that uh, basically deep neural networks that are successful without human insight. Uh, so I may, hopefully I'm rephrasing this correctly, but I mean, does it mean that you don't even put in uh, some I mean, conservation laws or constraints on the system or how did, how's the connection for an outsider? That's a great question. Um, I mean, in this example, we showed that you don't need to pre-process your data and that the physics and you know, that the network can handle it. In practice, what this means is we have more powerful solutions, not infinitely powerful. And so now we're tackling harder and harder problems. And frankly, we're still running into the same thing. We have a limitation in the ability of these networks to solve hard, the hardest problems. And so for the hardest ones, we still do physics preprocessing, and in two different ways. One is sometimes we transform the data on input to make it easier. But more importantly, we structure the network because the way we build the network reflects, uh, as you say, like domain constraints, um, things we know about the nature of the data. Like, hey, this is images, maybe you should use you know, techniques from images, or these um, is an arbitrary number of inputs because these are particles. And so take that into account. So often we build the structure of the network to reflect insights about the data. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Good, anybody else? Uh, I have a question. Yeah, please state your name. Hi, I'm Noah. I'm a, I'm a grad student at SDSU. Uh, studying physics. Um, hi, and I was wondering, um, when did you first start learning about machine learning and how it could be applied to physics? And if you had any um, like recommendations of resources for like students who want to learn more about it? Sure, I've always been interested in machine learning. I actually did computer science as an undergrad and did um, AI and machine learning um, as a second major. Um, and my brother is a professor of machine learning, so um, I've been around it for a while, and um, it's always been fascinating to me. I was always hoping to find more applications of machine learning uh, in particle physics. Now, if you're interested in this kind of stuff, um, first suggestion is make sure you know how to code in Python. That's a general suggestion for life and physics. 
Um, and there are a lot of great tutorials at Keras and TensorFlow. Those packages have a lot of great tutorials online for learning to use it. Um, so I would say, uh, take one of those tutorials, but then find yourself a problem. Most of this learning is best done um, when it's directed. Right? I need to solve this problem, how do I do it? Rather than just like abstractly sucking in information. So find a place you might think would be applicable in your research or your life and try to use machine learning to solve that. That's my advice. Thank you. Yeah. Good. Um, anybody else has a question? Yes. Uh, <clears throat> what are you using for your compute cluster? Uh, GP, GPUs or just regular crazed type machines? A lot of GPUs, yeah. And this is another reason why I partnered with the computer science department here is that they have a really sweet system. <laughs> and uh, so we mostly develop our networks on their system. But they definitely take advantage of GPUs when doing the training. And all of my students have a desktop with a nice GPU built in so they can do some training in their local environment. Thanks. Hi, I maybe have two questions. The first one is it looked like you converted your data into images. Um, is that discretization of the data causing any problems? Like it looks like continuous and now it's been. Um, and the second question is more general. It's relating to your approach. So it looks like you use the deep neural networks to set up uh, essentially goalposts for your problem. And then you're attempting to uh, work out what is the, the piece that you're missing from your kind of physics-based model. Um, how close were you able to get like a real physics description of that, that one piece, that, that last term that you were adding? Um, <clears throat> a great question. The second one was so fascinating that I've forgotten the first one, unfortunately. Oh, the discretization, yes. Uh, well, our detector is naturally discretized already. And we have calorimeter cells, and we cannot measure things inside the cell. And so that's why it's a very natural mapping from the information we have to the pixel um, process. It's not 100% because the cells are different sizes. And so sometimes we do lose a small amount of information. Uh, but we also have other approaches that are just lists of data and it performs similarly well. It tells us they're probably not losing a lot of information. Um, and you're absolutely right that we're using this as a goalpost. That's a nice way to describe it. I think I'll do that next time in theory. Um, because it tells us that there is information to be found. Um, and your question was, um, how do we know that we've captured all the information or do we understand uh, the physics that we've learned in this case? I think it was the second. And so yeah. this, this is fairly recent. And we, we worked with a particle theorist and said, please define this space for us. And he came up with this set of uh, energy flow polynomials. And so effectively now the AI speaks his language. And so we sent this back to him and said, what does this mean? Uh, what does this say? Is this a reasonable thing to be doing? Um, my suspicion, um, just from my limited understanding of the QCD theory, is that this is calculating sort of a, a non-safe quantity. It's not something that's infrared safe, which means that it's not easy to model as you go to very, 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 very low energies, soft gluon emissions. And so it's not the kind of thing you want to be calculating because you don't trust your simulator's ability to do it. And so the lesson here is, make sure you understand the information you're using because some of the information might be theoretically on shaky grounds. Remember, this is all simulated data. And so if it's not describing what's happening in the actual detector, you don't want to be doing it. So the lesson might, might be, oh, look, we are missing this piece of information that's valuable for learning the problem in simulation, but doesn't map to the actual data. So don't use it. And if you had just used the deep network with the images, you would be applying that, that uh, dangerous information. Okay, so your expectation is that um, maybe this quantity is, is not actually uh, obtainable in the, in the physical world. Yeah, or that our models of the physical data um, for this quantity are poor, in which case you wouldn't want to train your network on that. Perfect, thank you very much. Good, so there might be time for a last question. Anyone out there? Hey, did you uh, ever figure out uh, everything you wanted to know but were afraid to ask about the Higgs boson <laughs> or a Higgs particle? No, I still have questions. <laughs> okay. Oh, good. I'm going to bless your, your questions. How's that? Virtual, virtual blessings. All right. Have fun. I appreciate it.
Okay, Danny. So thank you so much for your stimulating talk. And so next time when you come to San Diego State, then we owe you at least a beer. All right. I'll go have one myself out of my fridge. Thank you, everybody. <laughs> okay. And have a good weekend. Thank you so much. Thank you all for attending.